The new MVP ladder is out on NBA.com. Seku has moved James Harden into the pole position, displacing the Greek freak. Joel Embiid has entered the picture as well at number five. Care to explain yourself? <laughs> yes, I would like to give you an 18-game explanation for why James Harden is now I think I know where you're going with number this. one on this list. Look, I think it would be disingenuous for anybody to look at the work of the reigning e you know, Kia MVP and not assume that he'd be anywhere but the number one spot. Harden's been fantastic. Under the circumstance, Griff, for him to play the way he has with as many different guys out of that rotation and lineup, let's give him his due. Mm -hmm. The coolest part about it is, and I wrote about it uh, this week, on NBA.com is that twice James Harden has come up short in the MVP race mm -hmm. because his narrative wasn't as good. He, he had numbers, you know, but he came up second to Steph in 2015 and then second to Russell Westbrook when both those guys had much more compelling narratives as to why they should win that award. Well, what better story could you have if you're James Harden than it's me by myself? All these guys are hurt. Capella's out. CP's gone. We were left for dead early in the year. We were 14th place, and now I'm on this unbelievable streak, and I'm leading us to all these different places. It'll be interesting to see if he can sustain it, but what a great turnaround for James Harden and the Rockets that's gotten him back into the mix in the MVP race. 42 points, 9 assists a game over those last 18 games. I is was, that a lot? That I was, like a lot. That's a lot. Good. That is a lot. I was one of the folks who voted for him in 2015. I was in the minority that season. I, well, I voted for him twice now. And the way that's going right now, I can't argue because given the situation in Houston and the way they have uh, were kind of left for dead for a lot, by a lot of folks early on in the season and the fact that they've gotten better in the absence of Chris Paul, that sort of screams MVP right now. Well, it's fascinating. Their roster is the antithesis of, antithesis of the situation the Warriors find themselves in, right? <laughs> right? We started the show with too many miles to feed in Golden State and it's going to take some time. In Houston's situation, when Chris Paul comes back, that's going to make an impact on James's ability to be James. Right now, he gets to hold the ball for 18 seconds on the shot clock if need be and shoot every shot with impunity, and everyone on the floor with him knows that's okay. Sometimes it's easier to play that way free and easy. Now, having said that, what he's doing statistically, he's being this prolific, winning games yeah. against all of the best teams in the league. It's it's miraculous. It really is what he's doing right now. Is Nobody's ever done this. The numbers are just mind-blowing. Every time we uh, cite a statistic, it goes back to, like, Wilt Chamberlain, typically. I mean, Wilt Chamberlain's numbers skew everybody else's yeah. in NBA history. Every, every record that we try to, you know, uh, try to split and come up with, we always come back, oh, yeah, Wilt did that a thousand more times than, than this guy. But what Wilt but you go back that far, that's amazing. But what Wilt didn't do was dribble and shoot step back threes. <laughs> no, right? so no. he has threes. become the most amazing, difficult shot maker, and he makes it look really easy. Right. So the sustainable thing you talked about, he is taking shots that for him don't require a great deal of effort quite often. Mm -hmm. So it is fascinating to see that he's been able to keep this going. I'm not sure he couldn't keep this going. It's just that when there's more mouths to feed there, it changes the dynamic a little bit. Well, in the context of the MVP race, to me, is I think something that people always forget about is it's not just you and how you're playing. It's the other guys. Mm -hmm. Giannis has an unbelievable season going right now, in a season where his team is, has gone to another level. So you're going to have to contend with Giannis when the final votes are taken. Steph Curry, the two-time Kia MVP, is playing like he wants to be a three-time mm -hmm. Kia MVP, doing historic things of his own. You add in Joel Embiid in the season he's having. Oh, Kawhi Leonard in Toronto. That's right. They're number one. In, you know what I mean? There's all these other guys, and I don't even want to bring up the other guy that's sitting out right now in L.A., who the minute LeBron comes back, right. he immediately, you know, burrows his way right back up into Probably the Probably start mix. making his case exactly. by returning and, and playing better basketball. And a lot of yeah. people tell you that LeBron's absence and the struggles the Lakers have had enhances his MVP case or should only serve to, to magnify the importance of having him in that lineup. So the, 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 the entire landscape has all these different stories you could tell. And that's why I say it year after year. Your narrative oftentimes is what separates you at the end of the day. Everybody's going to have MVP numbers, but does everybody have a story that sounds as compelling to these voters? And I'm one of them. I, you know, mm -hmm. We all have had our hand in the vote at some point or another, Matt. Mm -hmm. What are we swayed by? The raw numbers 
you know, your impact or a combination of those things, which usually means the narrative that's been weaved from the start of a season to the end. We knew Russ was going to win that MVP. Well, we talked about it in the summer. The day Kevin Durant decided he was leaving Oklahoma City, we are like, if Russ goes out and has a monster season, he's going to be on everybody's mind for MVP. Well, he went out and averaged a triple-double. Right. Pretty easy to figure that one out. Now, to me, this was kind of anybody's season with LeBron going west. Giannis stepped into that void and, to me, really took off, you know, in terms of his viability as a legitimate candidate. But James Harden is kind of flipping that now. He's kind of making that more difficult to do because Giannis can't do it in a vacuum. He's doing it in a league where there are other guys who are having outstanding seasons as well. Well, you guys being voters, and I am not, I'll ask you guys both a question then. What has to happen in Denver for Jokic to really get consideration? They, they're tied for the best record in the Western yeah, Conference. Yeah, he's on the list. The I mean, he didn't make the top five. Right. He's but on the list. For, in terms of the narrative, exactly how much more does he need to do before he's really in this conversation? I, it's not what he needs to do to me. Right. But he's got – he has – and this is a weird thing about the MVP voting, Matt. I don't know if you noticed this. You almost get penalized when you play on a team where there are other guys that play really well. Like, you yeah. know, there are people that right. would argue – that Jamal Murray is Denver's catalyst and, and best player, even though we know Jokic is the guy that they run things through and is really the center of their team, right. literally and figuratively, in terms of how they operate. Right. So it, he's, he's suffering from some of that, and I also think he's suffering from the fact that there are a lot of people who are still figuring out just how good he really is. And how I, good they are. I try to make myself less susceptible to the narrative by – by giving myself a pretty simple definition for the MVP, and that's the player most responsible for his team's very successful season. So in that context, Nikola Jokic is definitely in the conversation. There doesn't even matter necessarily if he's their absolute best player, right. but if he's the catalyst, if he's the, the linchpin to what they're doing and making it work, then to me he's absolutely in that conversation, and I, he should be at this point with their record. Well, using that definition... If Houston's injury issues are going to continue, this should just be called the James Harden award. Absolutely. <laughs> because Absolutely. what he's doing no, it, so low right now yeah. is unbelievable. Unreal. Right, and if there were a vote today, that's where that's probably going because in the context of, of all the injuries, this is a very successful season they're having right now, and without James Harden, no question. it wouldn't be a But this is season. exactly why he's in the number one spot this week, and it's a fluid list, obviously. But it's also the reason why, and I, if you saw my email over the weekend about the MVP ladder, you'd be mortified because some people... <laughs> They're so. How do I know, get on this email? Chase? They're so down the rabbit hole for their particular guy. Anytime you start an email, it says, "Well, listen, I know I'm just a fan of this guy, but well, the but is everything after the but is hard to digest." <laughs> yeah, but the, you got to call me out on. TV like <laughs> Sorry about that. The guy who gets <laughs> the guy who's getting the most love from his ardent fan base right now is Russell Westbrook. You know, people want to know, well, how can you not have Russell Westbrook? In the top five, he's averaging a triple-double again. Right. And I'm like, this is when you have to divorce yourself from the raw numbers and really study how a guy's playing. Sure. Russ is struggling. Like, he's, yeah. he is averaging a triple-double. But he's shooting. He's the worst high-volume shooter in the league right now. Right. And you look at his shooting numbers, which anybody that would, would wait this process, an MVP candidate, you can't ignore that. You can't ignore that. And the fact that he's got another guy on his team in Paul George who's every bit the MVP of the Oklahoma City Thunder this Absolutely, year. Yeah. Paul you know, George, I, would argue, I might even argue their defense is the MVP of the yes, Oklahoma and, City and Thunder. Yes, and Paul George is on the list. Paul George is in the top ten, Russ is not, right. which is, you know, upsets quite a few of Russ's fans around the world. This, uh, this segues uh, very well to something else Sekou does because he is now a one-man media conglomerate. <laughs> and on his uh, Hangtime Una. podcast this week, he discussed Russell Westbrook and the Oklahoma City Thunder with Eric Horn from the Oklahoman. Well, you worked your way up to NBA general manager from a, a level probably below where Sue Bird is right now. Right? Oh, significantly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, what, nobody in basketball cared what I had to say about anything. <laughs> but what what advice would you give her about moving up in an NBA front office? Well, I think she's doing it exactly right. First of all, while she's still focusing number one on playing, she's getting exposure to what it really looks like. When we brought Raja Bell into the front office in Cleveland, he was an invaluable asset to us and a huge resource as a player. But it took some time for him to figure out exactly what it would look like and what the responsibilities would be relative to his family. Because it's different, I think, for a player when they end up in the front office. They don't really understand. It's not like when you play, 
you don't go home from a road trip. You go to the office from a road trip. It changes. So I think getting exposure to it and understanding exactly what it is you're going to want to do and where your passion in the game lies is meaningful. And Sue's doing this at a time that we've got Becky Bonner, who's in a senior position in Orlando and going to be a GM at some point in this league for sure. Kelly Kruskoff of the Pacers, who was the president and GM of the Fever, somebody else who's in a very senior position. So Sue is coming in at a very good time to learn the league and figure out where her passion really lies. Yeah, and I think it's long overdue. Um, we've seen the, the basketball culture and, and how connected it is across the lines from the WNBA to the NBA to the G League to overseas. This is a, a global game for a reason, Griff. And I think it's got a universal code in terms of how you scout, evaluate, you know, uh, plan, plot, and put together teams. I mean, these things don't change dramatically from league to league in terms of the principles that you bring to the table when you're doing it. So why would you not take advantage of somebody like Becky Hammond or somebody who's operated at the very highest level and use the, everything that they bring to the game as a resource for your franchise. And Sue really also is benefiting from the fact that she's doing it in a great organization. Tim Conley, their president, has done a remarkable job in the draft. Arturis Karnisovas is somebody who's had a big, big role in shaping what their team looks like as well, has an international background that Sue can relate to. So she's learning what she's learning in a great place. Mike Malone, in his fourth year as a coach, has really established a culture there. It's meaningful, too, because... Sometimes you learn what not to do in an organization, mm. and she's being exposed to a lot of the right things. And you can't find many basketball resumes better than Sue Bird's. If you're looking for somebody with some smarts to bring in an organization, that's a good place to start. Uh, lots more to get to here on Game Time Live, including coming up to Marcus Cousins' season debut, and debut as a Golden State Warrior, an all all star lineup. The Warriors will roll out against the L.A. Clippers coming up at 1030 Eastern.